Christmas in 1992, I received a Sega Game Gear. Outside of those terrible Tiger Electronic games, this was the first real handheld system that I owned. With the Game Gear, I got three games alongside it. Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Chuck Rock, and Slider. I had really wanted a Sonic game, but those other games were picked out by my parents. I'm not sure what they saw in Slider that made them think I would enjoy it, but I'm glad that they did. Just look at this box art. It's terrifying. This character is supposed to be the hero of the game, but instead looks like one of those enemies in Metroid that circle around the platforms. Sega of America took the cute artwork from the Japanese version and redesigned it with a more extreme style of 90s attitude. It really doesn't work, and I imagine that this art turned off a lot of potential customers looking for a good game to play. When I would take my Game Gear to school to play at recess on days when we were stuck inside due to bad weather, I would play Sonic 2 or Chuck Rock. Slider was that guilty pleasure game that I would play when I was alone and would never admit to my friends that I was playing such a strange, weird game. Slider, known as Squeak in Japan, is an action puzzle game in the same vein as games like Wrecking Crew, Solomon's Key, or The Adventures of Lolo. In fact, Slider looks a little bit like a deranged version of Lolo. This game was released internationally under the name Slider only on the Game Gear. In Japan, it was available on the Game Gear and also the PC Engine, the system that would be renamed the TurboGrafx-16 for North America. While distributed by Sega, it was developed originally for home computers by... You know, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that and ported by Victor Musical Industries, a company that developed a handful of games for the Sega Genesis, CD, and Saturn. Their other games include the KEO Flying Squadron games, and many of the Sega CD and Genesis ports like Shadow of the Beast, Dungeon Master 2, Star Wars Rebel Assault, and Fatal Fury Special. Since Sega of America changed the name and box art for the game, I'm also assuming that they changed the plot of the game, since it seems very topical to the environmental politics in the United States at the time. Slider's world, known as Rosen, has been invaded by the Scum Lords and has been polluted with poisonous toxins. It's your job to clean up the toxic waste to restore your world to a utopia. I also think that the story was changed because the ending is a cutscene of you saving your girlfriend, or maybe the Princess of Rosen? Also, the story is limited to a page in the instruction manual, doesn't discuss anything about the princess, and nowhere in the game itself does it reference the toxic waste plot. Gameplay-wise, Slider is an action puzzle game, and it's highly addictive if you like those types of games. I would say it's closest in design to a game like The Adventures of Lolo, or even Bomberman. The game has 99 levels to complete, and it does have a password option to start where you left off. You start with 3 lives and 10 continues to complete the entire game. The goal is to navigate the maze of each level, turning all of the tiles pink by walking over them. It seems like a simple concept, and the first few levels are relatively straightforward, featuring easy levels with a few enemies that just get in your way. But as the game progresses, the levels become more complex and difficult. Throughout each level, you'll encounter enemies that will try and stop you in various ways. There are enemies called menaces, they move around randomly and just get in your way. A variant of the menaces, the painter, show up at later in the game and paints over the pink tiles destroying all your progress. There are ghosts which will chase Slider down and can move through solid barriers and pass over pits. Slipsters move around randomly and incredibly quickly. If he is on screen, you need to destroy him quickly, otherwise his speed and random movement can easily cost you a life. There's also tentacles which shoot bullets at you, and two types of fireballs. Crashes will burn down walls. Doing this creates new tiles that you have to change to pink, but you can also use this guy to your advantage since burning down a barrier might allow you access certain tiles a lot easier. The other fireball enemy is the Bopper. These guys can't be destroyed and you'll have to sneak past them. On top of enemies, the game will present you with different environmental hazards as you go. First, you'll be introduced to the pits, which kill you if you walk or are pushed into them. Next, you'll start seeing arrow tiles on the floor. These push you in the direction that they're pointed, 
but you'll have the ability to walk slowly in the opposite direction. You can also use them to speed across an area if you walk in the direction of the arrow. You'll see lots of these arrow blocks, especially near pits, requiring you to be extra careful around them. You'll also see tiles with cracks on them. These are booby traps that collapse into a pit when you walk over them. There are also bomb tiles that once stepped on will destroy an area around it and create a pit. Luckily, the bomb tiles are all marked, so you'll never be surprised by a hidden bomb tile, and you'll have a brief second to escape to solid land once, you're, once you hit the tile. There are also enemy nests scattered around the level. These will spawn new enemies of a particular type, but each nest will only spawn a new enemy after the current enemy from that nest is destroyed. The nest closes periodically, killing you if you walk over them while that's happening. The worst environmental hazard is the ice tiles. Once you step on an ice tile, you'll be pushed in the direction you are facing and you have no control. This means that you can be directed into pits, and levels are designed around needing to cross the ice tiles only from certain directions. Although there are many hazard tiles, there are a few beneficial tiles that you can enter. Green tiles will freeze enemies in place for a short time, but these are one use only as they become pink after you cross over them. There's also teleport tiles that you can use to transport between. Some levels require you to use them to cross barriers, while other times they work as a shortcut to other sides of the map. In order to survive, you'll have to use your weapons and collected items. You'll start with a standard bullet that fires in front of you, but you can upgrade it. Random weapon drops appear throughout the levels, and those include four-way shots, diagonal shots, lasers that can also destroy walls, an eight-way short-range shot, and a freeze gun that stops enemies in their tracks. Item drops are also random and include extra lives, shoes that let you walk on ice and arrow blocks freely, temporary and vulnerability shields, wings to move faster, hourglasses to increase the time limit of the level, exit stage doors that allow you to jump instantly to the next level, and food like hamburgers and ice cream that give you points. There are also four different color teddy bears that you can collect. Collecting all four colors gives you an extra five lives and instantly sends you to the next level. Be careful though, if you pick up a teddy bear of a color that you already have, you lose that one instead. There's also the mystery box item. This can be anything from extra lives, teddy bears, weapons, or even things that could harm you. Some of those things can be like reversing the D-pad controls, something everyone just loves in video games, or an item that makes you turn the pink tiles back to blue, undoing everything you've accomplished. The stage design overall is very well thought out. The difficulty curve is also pretty fair. The first 20 levels get you used to the various gameplay elements, and it gets progressively difficult as you go. The last 30 stages of the game are the hardest and will take a lot of careful planning and really challenge your skills. Some levels are very large and you get a decent amount of time to complete the stage. On the other hand, some levels are speed tests. You'll only need to paint over a few tiles under very strict and short time limits. I did like this as there's some variety throughout the stages. Some of the stages, though, are pretty interesting in concept, but simply weren't executed very well due to requiring some luck with the RNG. These are the levels where you're on separate islands that require enemies to chase you to fill in tiles over the pits. Sometimes they'll come right for you, but since their movement is purely randomized, sometimes they'll just not cooperate and you'll run out of time waiting for them to move into the correct direction. Other stages, especially later levels, require you to paint tiles in a very particular order due to the explosive tiles blocking off areas and preventing you from backtracking or reaching them if you did it out of order. This can be especially frustrating, but at the very least, you can reset the level at the expense of one life. The one thing missing from this game is boss fights. Since you do have projectile weapons, it could have worked and having a boss every 20 to 25 stages would have broken the game up a little bit better. There's also no final boss. Complete level 99 and you're taken to the ending cutscene and credits. The color graphics really make this game work. The color choices allow you to clearly see enemies, tiles that you have painted over, 
and tiles that you need to paint. Every special tile or barrier has its own color and design. It's almost like this launch title was specifically designed to show the benefits of a color screen, as this game wouldn't really work on the Game Boy screen with four shades of putrid green. The screen layout seems to be designed very well. I never felt that it was too zoomed in and never got ambushed by an enemy that appeared suddenly on screen. Slider always is at the center of the screen and you always have time to react to enemies or hazards. The sound is pretty good too. There are three music tracks for the levels and they rotate with each level and are pretty catchy. There's also a title screen theme, level start and complete jingles, and apparently an unused track with a 1 minute 22 second loop that is unused within the ROM. Sadly, the sound effects are just serviceable and nothing special. Here's a sample of the music you'll be hearing during gameplay. The Game Gear version is a great overall game. The levels are short enough that you can play a few while you're on the go, and you get a new password after each level completion. Actually, when I was a kid, I would sometimes, in car rides, just enter random passwords trying to find one that worked, since they're only four letters long. At one point, I was able to randomly enter a password to get to a level in the high 60s. Back then, I felt like that was quite an accomplishment. Almost no one talks about this game, and it's a shame. If you like arcade action puzzle games, you're really going to enjoy this one. Getting through the game is quite a marathon, but none of the levels are impossible, and thanks to the internet, you can get a list of all the level passwords to help you along the way. The gameplay is solid, with overall good level design, good graphics and sound, and very few flaws. It's also a very inexpensive Game Gear title if you're a collector, and Game Gear emulation is very good if you're just looking to try out the game on a TV or monitor. There's also hardware options as well. The Analog Mega SG, for instance, can play Game Gear cartridges with an adapter, and in addition to the original cartridges, there are also flash carts like the EverDrive. I hope you found this review insightful and entertaining. I have a lot of nostalgia for the Game Gear since it was my first handheld system, and this game in particular. So I really enjoyed playing through it again 30 years later and having the opportunity to provide a review for it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Until then.